Well, hello, and thank you for joining us on this Sunday evening for Sunday's Bible Study Hour. Uh, Joel and Susan and Paul and Rebecca and the rest of the Turners are on the road, and actually they have a VBS this evening, uh, and so I have been asked to prepare something for this evening for you. And it gives me the opportunity to once again uh, go back to the archives and allow you to enjoy a message from Lee Hamoki, Cowboy Lee Hamoki. And this was given in 2013 at a Generation Next kind of get together, which was uh, uh, younger people, teenagers, uh, that uh, Lee began. And uh, so he, this is a message that he delivered to them, a challenge from God's Word. Uh, and it's called, God and Cowboys Do the Same Thing. So, uh, after a few informal commercials or promotions, uh, we will present you to, with Cowboy Lee Hamoki uh, this evening. So, I hope you enjoy. Thanks for joining us. Take advantage of Bible Doctrines to Live By online ministries. Just search Bible Doctrines to Live By on Facebook or YouTube. Join us live on Sundays for the Bible Study Hour at 5 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, where Pastor Joel McGarvey expounds on the Word of God. And on Tuesdays is our Tuesday Bible Time at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where Joel McGarvey has been unfolding the Word of Truth. You will be blessed. I will be blessed. And then each Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday on Facebook, get your coffee and join us for a time of devotion and prayer on Morning Coffee with a Bite of Scripture. And if you miss any of our live shows, they are always archived on YouTube and our website at www.bibledoctrines.org. Take advantage of Bible Doctrines to Live By online ministries and keep looking up. Psst. Psst. Over here. Yeah. Hi, kiddos. My name is Al the Crocodile. I just wanted to make sure you knew about Miss Susan's Bible Buddies. Yeah. We are every other Monday, a new episode comes out. And you can find us on the Facebook and YouTube. Just search for Bible Doctrines and you'll find Miss Susan and her Bible Buddies. So, if you haven't yet, check us out. Miss Susan's Bible Buddies. Facebook, YouTube. See you then, kids. Hey kids, make sure to get your parents' permission to find Miss Susan's Bible Buddies on Bible Doctrines to Live By on Facebook and YouTube. Be sure to have your Bibles ready as Miss Susan takes her buddies through God's Word. You'll find Bible illustrations to make the lessons fun and relatable. Wow. Wow. That's amazing to me. You'll also find some helpful crafts ready to join Miss Susan and her friends as they sing songs and help you with some Bible verses. Remember boys and girls, I love you and God loves you. See you next week. Hello, we want to take a few moments to tell you a little bit about the ministry of Bible Doctrines to Live By. We are located in Comstock Park just north of Grand Rapids, Michigan. We have a wonderful dedicated staff ready to help you as you grow and serve in the Lord. One of the many helpful things that we have at Bible Doctrines to Live By is a publishing ministry. We have many books, booklets, pamphlets, and tracts to help you in your understanding of God's Word rightly divided. We also send out our magazine, Truth of Flame, free of charge to our mailing list four times a year. Another resource is our variety of tracts to help you and others come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through the Gospel. We also have tracts on other certain topics. We're able to print on site to help keep our costs down. We also offer curriculum for all ages. It can be used in churches, like Sunday school, uh, youth ministries, homeschool, and many other opportunities. 
You can learn more about our curriculum, tracks, and other literature by visiting our website at www.bibledoctrines.org and you click on the store on the header at the top of the page where you can browse all of our selections. Besides our publishing ministry, we also have a traveling itinerant ministry where we go to churches to help with family Bible school as well as Bible conferences. Here at Bible Doctrines to Live By, our desire mirrors God's desire to see all be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. If you have any further questions, you can contact us with the information on your screen. Phone number 616-785-3618 or visit our website at www.bibledoctrines.org and of course you can email us at staff at bibledoctrines.org and you can always watch us on Facebook and YouTube and don't forget to follow us on Facebook and YouTube and now on to our regular program. And, uh, I don't know whether you know it or not, there's a young fellow who's 20, uh, what is he, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28 years old now. I gave him his first rope when he was 12 years old. And today he's been in the Guinness Book of World Records twice. He's considered by far uh, the current world's champion trick roper. And uh, the interesting thing is that, uh, of course, these people were a part two. They are a part of a, a large homeschool family. And uh, their parents are owners of the Antietam Recreation Park in uh, Hagerstown, Maryland. So if you're ever out there, you've, you've got to go. Uh, they put on a cowboy show there that's, uh, uh, I was going to say equal, it's not. It's equal or better to anything that you'll see at Branson, where there's any number of people who are involved in horse or what we call cowboy skills. And uh, so uh, the fellow that I'm talking about is Andy Rotz, and he has duplicated all of the tricks uh, of uh, the famous uh, trick roper Will Rogers. Will Rogers was an Oklahoma cowboy. Uh, he was a very good man. Unfortunately, so far as we know, he was not a Christian. His father was a uh, the senator, an Oklahoma senator, his mother was a Cherokee Indian, and Andy took it on himself to duplicate all of those tricks. Uh, the one trick that Andy does has never been duplicated, and uh, unless you see it, I can't fully explain it to you, but uh, he does a flat loop like Andy or like uh, Cody does, and he starts way at one end of the platform, and he spins it, he runs, and turns a somersault inside the loop, and comes up with the ropes st still going. <laughs> and it, it's a sight to see. Uh, at any rate, I thoroughly enjoy that. And the greatest thing I have to say is, I thank God for the power of the gospel. And uh, it's a lot of good exercise, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I frankly feel that, that there's something wrong with somebody that doesn't love an animal. And uh, of course I think I was very special and anybody is very special who grows up with some love for an animal, and especially a horse, a good horse. Uh, but above and beyond that, truthfully, uh, spinning that rope gives you all different kinds of opportunities to give the gospel. And uh, that's because uh, God and cowboys do the very same thing. You asked me, I knew you were going to ask, what would that be? Well, uh, the cowboy, uh, among other things, spends his life rounding up the strays. And if you think about it for a minute, that's what God does. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. There's none that seeks after God. No, not one. Uh, guess who goes after the sinner? 
And that's the Lord Jesus. God the Father had a plan. God the Father was not willing that any should perish. The plan is executed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came specifically to round up the strays. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And of course, what you know about salvation is the work of God the Holy Spirit. God gave us his word. His word is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and is the critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So what you know about salvation, what you know about your spiritual need, it comes only, number one, through the word of God. Amen. And number two, through the person and work of the Holy Jesus, the Holy, Holy Spirit. And Jesus, of course, is the Savior. Well, let's see. Uh, Cody, thank you. That was a special treat for me. We were in the Minneapolis, Minnesota, last time I saw Cody, I think. And we are a fairly large church. It was on Sunday morning, and Cody uh, uh, was a little late getting there, and I got up, and I got it started, and I can't remember what I said, and lo and behold, here comes Cody running down the aisle, spinning the rope, and uh, uh, he stole the show. I thought it was just wonderful. And... Uh, I wish I could tell you that we've seen thousands and thousands of people come to know Christ as Savior, but I can tell you this, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, Amen. and God is still in the soul-saving business. All right, I'm going to have you open your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And if I were to entitle this chapter, I'd call it Good News, Bad News. Good news, bad news, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and uh, we'll work our way down to verse 14, where we're told, as we were told last night, the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge. That if one died for all, then we're all dead. Let's pray, and then we'll look at the Word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Dear Father, thank you now for this, your Word. This is no ordinary book. Uh, we humbly bow before it. We yield our thoughts, our intents, our ambitions, our goals to the authority of the Word of God. Pray that Christ Jesus, our Savior, might be magnified. He is worthy of praise. And I pray, dear God, now that we'll be able to read and then digest and apprehend and lay hold of some of these truths. And may they become evident through the filling of the Spirit in the things that we say, the plans we make. Uh, the goals we have, the dreams. We pray that Christ Jesus might be able to live out his life in and through us. He is our head. We're his body. We're joined to him. We thank you for that. The world doesn't have any idea what we're excited about. They think we're strange. And yes, there is a sense in which you actually called us peculiar people. We really are uniquely yours. We belong to you. We were crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in and through us. Amen. I pray your blessing now, dear God, uh, through this short time as we look at your word. In Jesus' matchless name and for his glory alone, I want to pray. Now, I'm going to start out right there in the first verse. I'll work my way down through. I may skip a few verses. I don't know exactly how I'll do this. Uh, I want you, first of all, to see uh, 
the focus of the instruction is in the word we. And in a moment I'll point out some of the repetition of that word we. But you need to know that that is what we would call a corporate we. Look up here. Obviously a corporate we includes the personal we. So I'm not implying that this is not and cannot be personally applied. But uh, long before it was personally applied, it was corporately. It was a work of God. The we here is the body of Christ. Not just anybody. But there's a sense in which in eternity past, God actually, though it was not revealed until and except through the Apostle Paul, that God had an intent. He had a new administrator or a new agency through which he would execute his plan. Now I hope you understand what I'm saying, that in dispensation and ages past, God had a plan and God executed it. And uh, for the first uh, maybe 1,500, 2,000 years, God executed his plan through the Gentiles. That's Romans chapter 1. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. And so God gave them up. God gave them three times in that chapter. He says God gave them up. And that's sort of a biblical principle at the mouth of two or three witnesses. Uh, and by the way, that's exactly what God did with the Jew. Jesus came to his own. Salvation was of the Jew. There was a time when the Gentiles executed the plan of God. But when they knew God, they glorified not him as God. God gave them up. Well, then the ball, uh, we would say, is in the, and was then placed into the court of the Jew. What advantage has the Jew, Paul says? Oh, 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 much in every way, for unto them were committed the oracles of God. So guess who's carrying the ball? Guess who was responsible for the dissemination of the truth? It was the Jew. Salvation was indeed of the Jew. What advantage? Did, well, they had a head start over everybody else. But then we're told that God shifted gears again, again because of unbelief. Jesus came to his own, and his own received him not. And you remember the sad words, crucify him, away with him. We'll not have this man to reign over us. His blood be upon us and upon us. Our children. I frankly, I have a hard time to even say that. I can't imagine. I just can't imagine that kind of unbelief. God came to save, and through unbelief, they rejected it. Well, what happens? Well, God shifts gears again. And we can see again in the book of Acts. Acts 13, lo, I turn to the Gentiles. Acts 18, lo, I turn to the Gentiles. Acts 28, same thing. I turn to the Gentiles, seeing you now, I put it far from you, three strikes and you're out. And uh, so now, where is the ball? Who has the responsibility? Who's supposed to be executing the plan of God? Who's carrying the ball today? Well, that's all wrapped up here in this word we. It's the body of Christ. Uh, and then you and I are, of course, individuals. Individually in that body by personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So in verse 1, for we. Verse 2, we have. Verse 2, we groan. Uh, verse 4, we that are in this tabernacle. Verse 16, we are always competent. Uh, verse 7, for we walk 
Verse 8, we are confident. Down in verse 10, we must all appear. Verse 11, we persuade men. Verse 12, we commend not ourselves. And then it changes down here in verse 13 or 18, us. Uh, reconcile us. Hath given us. Hath committed unto us. Verse 20, again. Now then, we are ambassadors. And then, by us. So, now, I did all of that to emphasize the fact that you cannot, if you're a believer, uh, this passage of scripture will not allow you to divorce yourself uh, from the program and plan of God. Uh, that's because you're in the body of Christ. Now, I don't have time to explain all that, but I hope you understand that at the moment of salvation, God the Holy Spirit does something very wonderful. God the Holy Spirit does something that was not done in the Old Testament. God the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. We are in Christ. Our life is hid with Christ in God. So at the moment of belief, God the Holy Spirit takes that believing sin who earns or deserves nothing. It's entirely by the grace of God. And that sinner simply believes that Jesus Christ was the substitute. That whatever the penalty was for sin, Jesus did pay it all. And on the basis of faith, I simply believe that God the Holy Spirit takes that believing sinner, and here's the Lord Jesus, and he baptizes him. Every now and then people ask me, do you believe in baptism? I have lots of times say, I hear you don't believe in baptism. And I say, whoa, wait, who? I don't know who told you that. I believe in baptism. And of course the Baptist folks take a sigh of uh, relief. Okay, I thought you was way off in uh, left field. I let them stew about that for a little bit and I said, uh, yeah, but now you have to ask which baptism? And then I let them think about it a little bit, and I say, furthermore, I believe baptism saves. And I do. There's only one verse in all the Bible that tells me how I get into, how do I become a part, how is my life hid with Christ and God, and that is a spirit baptism. Amen. God the Holy Spirit actually takes the believer. Now, wait a minute. You may not even know that. You could be 20 years old, and if you're not studying the Bible, you may just now be figuring it out what happened at salvation. It's a non-experiential thing. It's something that God does in a wonderful, mysterious way. You believe on the Lord Jesus, and the Holy, the Holy Spirit puts you into Christ, and if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So the minute you get saved, the Holy Spirit baptizes you. Now, I don't hesitate to use that word. The word baptize, uh, uh, by the way, there's at least 11, maybe 12, or 13 different uses of the word baptism. Uh, most of which have nothing to do with a water ceremony. How can that be? Well, the meaning, the root meaning for the word baptism simply means to identify. It means to so identify with, so much so as to become one with. That's what it means. Uh, the Roman soldiers, uh, before battle, often baptized their sword in blood. And what were they were doing is they were identifying that instrument of death with blood. Moses and the children of Israel were baptized in the sea. Uh, when you and I are saved, we share identification with Christ. That's exactly what Paul meant, and I already quoted that verse. Uh, where we are in Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Well, wait a minute, when did I die? When did you die? You died when Christ died. Amen. You're so identified with Christ 
So much so that when he died, you died. When he was buried, you were buried. Uh, when he was resurrected, he is our life. He that hath the Son hath life. I have the blessed hope of resurrection. Uh, why? Because I joined a Baptist church, Methodist church, a Pentecostal church, Lutheran church, Catholic. No, not at all. Because of the word of God and the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. So I just want to realize that this whole chapter uh, is about you. It's about the body of Christ. Uh, the body of Christ is the executor of the plan of God today. These are not my hands. These are not my feet. These are not my ears. This is not my lips. I'm a member of the body of Christ. The Bible is very clear. He is the head. We are the body. And by the way, you can't separate the two. Oh, that's our eternal security. I am secure because I'm in Christ. And it's true. We do live out the life of the Lord Jesus in the filling of the Holy Spirit. When we read the Word of God, grow in grace and knowledge, rightly divided, and then we execute it by faith. We are executing. We are carrying the ball. Oh, that's what's coming up when we get down to the last part of this. We are now ambassadors for Christ. We're ministers of reconciliation. Let's move on. Bad news, good news. All right? For we know that our earthly house of this tabernacle, that if it were dissolved, we have a building a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So please notice the bad news first. And look up here. Look in the mirror. That's hard for young folks. By the way, i got to stop right there before I get sidetracked here. Uh, I want to thank God for this fellowship. I think what you're doing here is so important and so wonderful. And uh, I don't want to embarrass Hannah, uh, but uh, Hannah, I know you were somewhat tempted and debated a little bit. Do we carry it on? Am I right? Uh, should we throw in the towel? And there were some obstacles. And quite frankly, I'm glad you bit the bullet and exercised faith. Look, look. look. Is there a need for this? Amen. And my personal belief is that for time, talent, or money invested in the lives of boys and girls, young people, college age, there's no better spiritual return. Uh, do not, I'm talking to our leader here. Do not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if we faint not. Now, I'm going to just meddle for just a minute. Do you mind? I hope you don't mind, so I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> now, listen, I'd like to see you carry this on. I, frankly, I don't know what you guys have planned. I, I'm just maybe completely out of line in suggesting this. But I think it would be great for you folks while you're right here to take an hour and, uh, and uh, several of you who may be so inclined to sit down and decide how we're going to do this. Who's going to carry the ball? Who's going to take the lead? This gal's getting married. Maybe she'll keep her. That's all right. Marriage doesn't destroy everything. Uh, <laughs> sure. It may just enhance it. Amen. But look here. I don't know where the vision for doing what you're doing came from, but I'm sure it was of the Lord. And I want to tell you, in all honesty, being here last year, last year and here, honestly, was close to the highlight of my year. I just couldn't believe that there were young people, college-age young people, unmarried young people, getting together to be and to promote the next generation. Amen? 
I think it's a worthy goal. Uh, I'll leave it up to you, but it's just a suggestion. I would, I would think you could donate or uh, devote an hour to deciding. Uh, you're going to have to decide several things. Where do we go from here? How do we do it? Uh, how will we raise the funds? Uh, those are kind of things. All right, now, the we. The bad news is, looking in the mirror, is nobody here getting younger. All right? I, I once was young, and now i got the four Bs. Bunions, bulges, bifocals, and baldness. <laughs> Look in the mirror. This old house. This old house will one day be, look at that word, dissolved. That means back to dust. Uh, humanly speaking, uh, 70 years, you know what, I'm 76 years old now. That means I'm living on, according to the Bible, I'm living on borrowed time. Time is running out. Now, humanly speaking, that's the bad news. I'm not really excited about getting old and aching when I get up in the morning and uh, everything else that goes with growing old. That's the bad news. But here's the good news. We have, and by the way, uh, that's in what we call the perfect tense. It means we have with a result that we keep on having. We have a building of God. We have a permanent possession of God and house not made with hands. Emphasis on the word eternal in the heavens. Now he explains a little bit of what happens as the uh, clock ticks and time goes on. With every tick of the clock, with every breath, yes, we're getting older. And if you've not reached that age, you will when you wake up in the morning, as Paul says here, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. I can't explain much about heaven and nobody else can either. Heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place. Paul said he knew a man who was there once. I personally think that was Paul, taken up to the very throne room of God into the third heavens. Do you know what the Bible says? He saw things and heard things that were not possible to be uttered. Heaven, can you imagine? A home eternal in the heavens. Someday now, later on in the book of Ephesians, by the way, this next week I'm going to be over here in Ashtabil, I'm going to be preaching on uh, the first three chapters of Ephesians. And uh, we're going to take a look at what some of those heavenly things are and what it's all about. But heaven is a wonderful place. It's built by God. Now we may grow a house which is from heaven, Verse 3, this is embarrassing. <laughs> if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Now look up here. <laughs> I don't want to see you naked. <laughs> oh, if I wasn't blind before, I'd be then. I would sure be. And you do not want to see me naked. And Paul, he's talking about being clothed upon with heaven. Whatever that means. Oh, there's going to come a time when we'll know in Ephesians it says that in, now listen to this, that in the ages, and again this is on the, this is on the, the perfect tense, and that on the ages, upon the ages, upon the ages, upon the ages, upon the ages, of forever and forever and forever, he's going to show unto us the riches of his grace in Christ Jesus. It'll take all eternity.
right there in the book of Ephesians. I think it's uh, chapter 2, verse 10. Do you know, uh, do you know, uh, you know an angel is called a holy angel? He hears words like grace, salvation. Well, he's never experienced it. He's always been holy. But do you know why the angels rejoice over one sinner who gets saved? Because the sinner is already under the condemnatory sense of death. The wages of sin is death. But what happens? God takes that hell-bound, hell-deserving sinner, and he saves him. How? By grace. Now the angel looks down. The Bible actually read it. Chapter 2, verse Chapter 2, verse 10. To the intent. God shows the angels. There's Lee Hoboki, that dirty, no good. That one, that, you, that's grace. To think that God could save me. And God is no respecter of persons, so I'm satisfied he probably says the same thing about you, too. <laughs> Just think that God could save me, unearned, undeserved, entirely by faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul's all excited here. He doesn't want to be found naked. He's anxious to be clothed upon, verse 4. For we that are in this tabernacle, again he mentions it, we groan. Being burdened, not that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. And we're told where life is deposited. He that has the Son hath life. Jesus came not only to give us life, I'm quoting the Bible. He came to give us life and give us life more abundantly. And I might add, according to this passage of Scripture, eternally. Now look at me. I wouldn't give you one snap of the finger. I wouldn't give you a ten cents, one thin of a dime uh, uh, for a salvation that couldn't save me and keep me saved. Amen. You see, salvation is by grace. How do I keep saved? By grace. As you have received Christ Jesus, so walk in him. How did you receive it? You received it by faith. Now we have the written word of God and we walk in it. That's how we grow. And I might add, we grow especially when we rightly divide it. And again, by the way, Hannah, that's another reason why I hope you folks will clarify your vision. Take another look at why you're here and what you're trying to do and what needs to be done. And, uh, and I think one of the great reasons is uh, the Christian community and even some of our rightly dividers are losing focus. Do you know we have grace churches that are starting to baptize? Do you know that? I don't know how many churches I've preached in. I've been to a mall. They say, hey, uh, I come to preach, and they say, well, hey, uh, don't mention the mystery here. You think I'm joking? Oh. Uh, one of the leaders in the movement says, if you're going to preach that stuff here, it doesn't belong behind this pulpit. <laughs> on Sunday night, Wednesday night. The ones who need it are on Sunday morning. Um, and I don't want to be overly harsh. They're saying, well, we don't believe in baptism, uh, but we believe, oh, get this, this exact quote. He came to my office, sat down, and says, we're going to start baptizing. Uh, and that's because... Uh, we believe, here's the quote, we believe it has uh, what kind of significance? Historical. Yeah, historical significance. Do you know what that is? That's Garbage. tradition. Yeah. 
I love that one. I hope it shows. I suppose at least 50% of my preaching is in non-grace churches. Darlene, am I exaggerating when I say that some of those non-grace churches get more excited over what we call the grace message than some of our grace people? It's true. It's true. I preached last week two weeks ago on Pentecostal church. Wasn't this Pentecostal preacher, but I heard that one preacher afterwards. He says, Man, he says, I never heard anything like that. And every night for a whole week, we'd sit down at the table, get out a pencil and piece of paper, and I had the greatest time of my life. And show him. Folks, this is what Paul calls a precious deposit. And uh, it's not going to do me much good to preach it to the old folks. Uh, the ball's in your court. I'm preaching now. I'm pointing fingers. You young folks. If you don't do it, it won't get done. And I challenge you. No, I don't expect you to play the one string on the instrument. I want you to preach and teach the whole counsel of God. But don't forget that the way we understand the Word of God is the revelation of the mysteries. Amen. Uh, it'll, it, you have to learn. No, listen. The mystery never in and of itself saved anybody, but it's the golden key that unlocks the door. And there never was a time, this is my own personal opinion, in all the years I've been a pastor, I was a pastor for 25 years, and this is my 34th year of traveling back and forth and up and down across the United States. I can tell you, personally, I don't think there was ever a more needful time when we need to adjust our focus. And I'm so thrilled. Truthfully, I, it is, last year was one of the highlights of my year to be able to come and just, and again this year, to come and to focus on something that I think is very, very important. I think it's important for you to get together. I think it's important for you to enjoy each other's company. I think it's important for people of like precious, they emphasize the word like, like precious faith get together. Listen, I'm not mad at Baptists. I'm not mad at the Presbyterians. I'm not mad at the Pentecostals. You know, for a large part, they understand salvation by grace. I'm to, I'm to that degree, they are, quote, grace people. Uh, uh, but uh, beyond that, uh, when you depart from the word of God, rightly divide your sowing seeds of confusion. And this world is in such desperate need. Uh, we don't need to make a contribution to the further confusion in the Christian community. And where would we turn? God, please, raise up right here from a group like this. Raise up some young men who feel a call of God on their life to be a, a grace preacher. Amen. How about being a, a, a godly educator? I, I'm going to tell you something. I, I think I'm qualified. Maybe I should not qualify to say it. But quite frankly, for the most part, I wouldn't give you a snap of the finger for most Christian schools. Because what I've seen is, quite frankly, there's not much difference between, quote, most Christian schools and the public school. And uh, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I frankly, if I had to live my life over, I'd do everything I could to take the responsibility of teaching my own children bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I applaud those of you. I know it's no, not easy. But there needs to be, a, there needs to be a, a rethinking of who we are, why we're here, where we're going. All right, I want to get through with this. All right, uh, then he talks about verse 5. We have the earnest of the Spirit. That means we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. We have the down payment of the promises that God made through the Holy Spirit. Verse 6. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. 
We walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, willing. I have to pause here. Because it wasn't until I got a little older that I could honestly say with some anticipation. I'm not hanging on to life like I used to. I can't honestly say I'm homesick and want to die on the spot yet. But the older I get, the more wonderful heaven is. And the older I get, I can tell you, I have, at this point, I have almost more friends in heaven than I have on earth. And so the Apostle Paul says here, he is confident he would rather be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether we are present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Now very quickly, look up here. There's another one I want you to look at. There's an interesting concept here. We know that when you get saved, you're put into Christ. You have your heirs and joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. You're called a saint not because of your behavior, but because of your union with Christ. It's not a matter of behavior. I'm a saint because I am in Christ and the holiness of Christ was credited to my account the moment I got saved. Now we call that positional truth. That means that right now I'm seated. I, uh, my position in Christ is secure and eternal. But please notice something here. Now, as long as we're here in labor, I know this doesn't set good. I've been in enough grace churches too to know that this isn't going to set very good. I'd be accused of preaching legalism. But it flat, flat out says we labor to be accepted. Wait a minute, I thought we already were accepted. Positionally, absolutely, it cannot be improved upon, but as long as I am in the flesh, as long as I'm here walking on planet Earth, as long as I have the Word of God, and I am, a, I am an agent for the gospel, I am accountable. There is a sense of thing, a sense in the body of Christ of accountability. Oh, by the way, uh, who just mentioned that Eric, uh, Cody, gold, silver, precious stones, and that's another thing in the grace movement they don't want to talk about as rewards as though that were wrong. I'll tell you, I'm looking forward to some rewards. I surely, I'd whole lot rather have gold, silver, precious stones. Oh, he brings that up here. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. See, there's two judgments here. You have the great white throne judgment, and, and then you have a, then you have the judgment seat of Christ. One, uh, our sins. The moment I got saved, my eternal, my security, my salvation was secure. But now the judgment seat of Christ, I take that to mean for reward. Uh, how important is that? Uh, Gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hair, stubble, or you may be saved. I'm quoting scripture. But loss. You'll suffer loss. I'm not really trying to be cute, but yet I am I, when I say this. Uh, maybe you'll be saved for all eternity and then no rewards, nothing but leaves. Maybe you're going to spend all eternity cleaning out the latrines. I don't know what that means, but I do know that there's a difference between a level of reward in the body of Christ in the future. So we have that, therefore we labor that we may be accepted of him. We labor, we're already accepted, but now there's a sense in which we labor. Now, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This is not a judgment for salvation. That we may receive things done in the body according as he had done, whether it be good or bad. Now here, hang on to your hat. This won't go over good in some churches. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Look at the context. By the way, that's the number one principle of understanding the Bible is the overall context. This is a passage of scripture that's wholly devoted, uh, focused 
on believers, believers who are in the body of Christ. Please notice, we persuade men, knowing the terror of the, what men? We're not talking about unsaved men here. We're talking about believers. Notice, it's not a judgment for salvation, but it is a judgment for reward. And knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Verse 12, he says, we recommend not ourselves. Down to verse 14, and this was where I was heading, and this is probably where I'll end. Why do we do what we do? Why does he persuade men? For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Now look up here again. Let me explain it. And there's a whole lot more that needs to be explained than what I've been doing in a hurry here. It's not our love. Do we do what we do because of our great love for Jesus Christ? I'm going to make a confession. My love for Christ, by comparison of many, is just a little tiny, puny little thing like that. It's not, I do not do what I do because my love is so great. I do what I do, and you ought to do, laboring to be accepted in the area of rewards. You labor to be accepted. Uh, Because of the love and grace of the Lord Jesus. It's his love. Look here. It's his love. The love of Christ. It's the love belonging to Christ. Focused in this direction. It was that love that arrested the Apostle Paul on the Damascus Road. It's the love of Christ. The love of Christ. How rich. How pure. How measureless. Unbounded love. The love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge. I didn't intend to do this, but I'm having fun. Huh? Where's some? <laughs> constrains us. What's your name? Paul. Paul? Okay. Paul. You're constrained. <laughs> Try and run away from me. Huh? Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Why did Paul do what he did? It, uh, it wasn't because he got a big fat salary. It wasn't because he was going to get a big promotion. It was because this kind of love, what a, oh, the love of God. And God said to Paul, hey, those people over there in Macedonia say, come over and help us. So where does Paul go? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what about those people over there in Philippi? Oh, oh, what about those, oh, those, those, those carnal people over in Corinth? Oh, let's go over there and help. Hey, you explain, try and explain. Try and, try and explain the life of the Apostle Paul. Independent of the love, why did Paul do? Why did he go through what he did? Why did he suffer shipwreck? Why did he go without? Why was he beaten? Why was he imprisoned? There's only one answer, the love of Christ, constraint. That's what, by the way, that's what the word constraint means. It means to be roped and hog-tied. You can be seated. <laughs> and that's the challenge. That's the challenge that we all have. It's the we. Who? Is it just the preacher? Is it just the evangelist? Is it just the missionary? And again, I'm going to say what I said once before. Oh, I pray God. 
Please, out of a group, even here, raise up some young man and say, I feel the God, call of God on my life to be a pastor. To be an educator. To be a missionary. There are other callings, but right now we're in need. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Now get this in verse 15. That he, that he, Christ, died for all that they which live. Huh, that's you. Are you saved? Do you have the life of, life, life of Christ? That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. We have a new focus. Though we had known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth, now he's the living, resurrected, glorified Christ. This is why the Apostle Paul said, Be ye followers of him, because he followed Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And all things... Which all things are in God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Christ Jesus, and hath given to us the body of Christ, the ministry of reconciliation. The word reconciliation is a word of peace. It means there's two warring parties. And God has brought the two warring parties together, the saved and the unsaved. Through the reconciling work of the Lord Jesus. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you, beg you by us, we pray you in Christ that be ye reconciled to God. Dear Father, we ask your blessing now. We know that this word is no ordinary word. It's God breathed. You've actually magnified your word above all your name. And I don't expect, Lord, it's not by the foolishness of preaching. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. Somehow or another, you'll work it all together. We preach, the Holy Spirit works. You'll move in lives, you'll change lives. We're new creations. I pray your blessing upon this group of young folks. We pray, oh God, that it will grow and grow and the vision will become intense and that you'll glorify yourself. For I ask this in Jesus' name, with head still bowed and eyes closed. I'm just gonna ask you to not call names. But I wonder how many of you might honestly feel that maybe God has spoken your heart. Maybe he is already pointing you in the direction of full-time Christian service. I wonder how many of you would say, Come with you. that's sort of in my heart. I want you to remember me in prayer. Would you put your hand up and put that down? I'll not call your name. You'd say, Come with you. Yes, I see that hand. Are there others? Yes. I don't know what God... Hey, listen, I'm praying for a move of God. I really, uh, I can't tell you how badly, and I'm not, listen, that's just my opinion, but in my opinion, I can't tell you how badly we need a real move of God, especially in our grace movement. Now, there are others that say, Preacher, I can't explain it, and I'm not making any commitment, except that I do sense that the, maybe that's God's leading me in that direction, to be a pastor, to be a missionary, to be a pastor's wife to be involved in Christian education. There's a lot of other areas, but anybody else, just quickly by your hand up and put back down. All right, God bless you. Anyone else? Yes, God bless you. God bless you. Dear God, I pray. I pray, God, that you'll work with these young people. What I'm asking for and what we need is something that only you can do. Yes, Lord. Ask this in Jesus' name and for his glory alone we pray. Amen.